Welcome to USA Global TV and Radio, where our mission is to provide education, entertainment, hope, and inspiration. USA Global TV and Radio connects you with experts and audiences all around the world every single day to help you succeed in business and to live a richer life. Visit us at usaglobaltv.com to learn about career and life-changing training and mentoring programs like The Listening Mentor. Subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed about our special programs and offers. Discover how you can become a guest on one of our shows or a host or producer of a USA Global TV and radio show of your very own. That's USA Global TV and radio, where the doctor is always in. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to USA Global TV and Radio, where we stand for education, inspiration, and hope across the world to our global audience. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck, and we are so excited to bring you a brand new show. This is the Planet Earth Show. This show will be on every other Monday in coordination with bringing you all kinds of information about what is going on our planet and what we can do to help. So I'm not alone. I have my dear friend and colleague and team member, Mr. Roland Friedel, who will be joining me. Let's welcome him and then we'll bring out our special guest. Hello, Roland. Good to see you again. Hello, Dr. Jacqueline. Great to see you again and, and great to see you on this specific show when we talk about planet Earth. I love it. I love it too. And I was super excited to put together this background and our show tile, because if we think about it, life is so much bigger than just us, just our entity, our home, our community. And when I look at this background, I just see the vastness of all of it and how some of the things that are happening, whether we're directly involved or we're not, we need education and awareness. And so I'm really excited about today's topic, which is wind and waves, turbines and the sea. We have somebody with us today who has really strong opinions about this topic, and that's why I'm super excited to bring him. But before I introduce him, let's have you share a little bit about the work that you do and the value you can bring to our audience. Thank you. Yeah, hello, everyone. My name is Roland. Um, as you can hear me from an accent, I'm, I'm from Austria in the middle of Europe. Uh, I was always a world traveler, traveling around the globe, working worldwide for different international businesses, uh, consulting them, training their stuff, optimizing the processes. And yeah, the last 14 years I've been living in Spain on a beautiful island before I was in Bali in the US and other countries. And right now, um, actually since, yeah, a little more than a year, since April last year, I moved into my motorhome, traveling around Europe and different places. Uh, right now I'm in Austria before I'm heading to another country. Yeah, the work I'm doing is uh, since almost two and a half decades, a little bit more than two and a half decades, um, I consult, I train, I coach uh, international companies with my team in different languages. Uh, that's my main job, so I say so. Uh, besides that, I do a lot of men's work. I am Actually, I came back uh, just yesterday from a men's retreat, 15 men in the wilderness. Really, really cool. No telephone network, but we could hear the, the wolf pack very close howling. So it was quite... Well, cool experience. I do a lot of men's work because I think we also have to improve as men to, to make this planet a better world. Um, I coach people who want to have a, a kind of weird lifestyle like myself, traveling and working from the most beautiful places in the world. That's another part. And then it's, of course, uh, my foundation in Switzerland, Respect Mother Earth, where I take care about planet Earth, Panchamama, Mama Earth or Body Mama, how they say in India. And because I, when I was traveling around the globe, I saw beautiful spaces, but I also saw some challenges uh, we are facing with, you know, um, industry, environment, uh, toxicifications, uh, yeah, destroying nature, mankindly. And yeah, that's why my heart is also pumping, if you will, so for Bancho Mama for, for, for Mother Earth. And I'm very happy that we start this show. And as, as I said, this show is not a, it's not a finger pointing one. It's about uh, showing you what we can do on a daily basis, but also discussing controversial topics like today. And 
because some people have another not the correct data, not the correct facts. Uh, what is was is shown on the mass media or what the elite or politics wanna wanna show us? So it's a quite interesting topic to very looking forward, especially also to our special guest. Right. All of them. Thank you so much. And yes, our guest is very special. He's a dear friend and he's one of our expert correspondents from the United Kingdom News and Culture Show. He also is an expert when it comes to aquaculture as well as fisheries. He is a television presenter and he's also been a celebrity chef and he was on our United Kitchen Show. Let's welcome our dear friend, Simon McDonald, joining us from Scotland. Hi, Simon. Hello, Hello there. Hi, it's Hi, nice nice to see you. Nice to see you again, Roland. I think it must be nearly a year since we uh, last did the did a show. I remember you've been in Spain on a seafood fair. Yes, that's right. That was uh, well, that was just over a year ago, and uh, it was a very successful uh, event. It was the world's biggest seafood uh, expo. Uh, it was just uh, it was jaw dropping to go in and see the, the size of this. You, nobody could get round it all in the the, the allotted time that uh, the show went on over three three days. You just couldn't get round it all in that time. It was amazing. Every country in the world, I think, just about was represented there. And of course, we were flying the flag for Scotland in a very big way as well, and promoting our langoustine and the you know from our clear waters. Nice, nice. Simon, you have extensive knowledge that most people aren't aware of in terms of the fisheries, in terms of the, uh, the I want to say the flow of fish from one country to, to a plate, for example. Uh, you also have extensive experience in smokehouses. Tell our audience a little bit about your background and then we'll get into today's topic. How, how long? How long is the show? <laughs> you have fifty <laughs> minutes. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and condense it down to that time. <laughs> but uh, no, I've been involved in fisheries, aquaculture, and uh, particularly with fish processing for about uh, forty-two, forty-three years now. So I'm sort of starting to get the hang of it, uh, but still learning something new every single day. And like all industries, it evolves and something new is happening or there's new legislation coming or at the moment we're faced with uh, with climate change and uh, so that in itself is creating its own set of issues and uh, we've all got to work with it you can never fight mother nature you've got to you've got to go with it and uh, and work with it rather than trying to uh, work against it uh, too many people have sort of buried their head in the sands like the proverbial ostrich and say, oh, you know it's all right it won't affect us you know we're only here for a short time so that's it but it it will affect us and it is affecting us now and it will in particular affect future generations for our children and our grandchildren and their grandchildren so we, we've really got to bite the bullet now and start repairing the uh, the problems that have arisen from you know from the past and it's not all man-made but a big percentage of it is and we can do something about it now brilliant thank you so much simon and i do want to acknowledge that we're getting a number of comments coming in so we'll try to get to them before the end of the show but we we need to move along with our conversation. So thank you to our fans for commenting. We do appreciate you. So Simon and Roland, I mentioned to you before, and I've said I live on an island, and I've been reading in the paper that they are bringing the wind turbines here, that they're not here in this house, but they're bringing them to the ocean here. And of course, people are up in arms because they have their magnificent view. And, um, and I think it's not just about the view, it's also about what impact these turbines are going to have to the ocean itself, the the cycle of life, the, the sea creatures. So Simon, you have a lot of knowledge about this and so do you, Roland. So I'm going to start off with our guest, Simon, then we'll go over to Roland. All right. Again, where do we start? Yes, <laughs> I, I live in an island as well. And the island is called the British Isles. Uh, so we are an island nation. It's a pretty big island, but uh, it is there nonetheless. So uh, the the UK government have uh, you know, gone in for these wind turbines in a big way. And you know, wherever you go now on, on land, you'll see you know, evidence of these things whirling away in the, the, the background. In the Scottish Highlands, the gamekeepers call them pheasant shredders because of birds flying into them and they finish up, you know, sort of oven ready plucked the whole lot. But 
there's a growing number of these going offshore now, which is a big concern to our fishing industry and to our aquaculture industry as well. Um, they've got planned for the next uh, few years a further 19,000 wind turbines in addition to what we already have offshore just now, and that's just inside UK territorial waters. So it's taking a lot of space up. It's taking a lot of valuable ground up. Um, there's a, a tremendous uh, feeling against them, but there's a lot of government money that's saying, you know, you're going to have them and that's it because we need to be more self-sufficient in power. Uh, the one area that they haven't really got to uh, realise yet and got to grips with, and I've been knocking on the door of uh, you know, some very high-ranking officials in the government, and that is that our national grid system that deals with the distribution of electricity throughout the uh, throughout Scotland, England, Ireland and Wales uh, is is not geared up to deal with this extra amount of power that is being generated. So these things are whirling about offshore there and actually nothing's coming ashore yet other than just a trickle. So uh, you know, the, there's, the, there's a lot of uh, thought got to be put into it just exactly how you're going to harness all this because no point in having these things out there doing the stuff and you can't actually cope with it ashore. It's like having, you know, huge big petrol pumps or water pumps or whatever uh, somewhere and trying to feed it all through a, a, a two inch wide pipe it doesn't work. So it's a lesson which will be learned by other countries as well, because I'm quite sure that the UK is not alone in this one. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Simon. Roland, what would you like to add? Yeah, I mean, it's the same here on, on, on the land. You know, I have no experience on, on from, from the seaside, so I'm very interested what, what, what Simon's thoughts are on that and Nick's expertise is. But what I see here on the land in, in my home country, Austria, in the, in, the, in the country I lived before for many years in Spain, and I was traveling through Spain uh, the last winter for a few months, and I met a lot of friends who were very resistant against these wine tournaments on, in the mountain, in the, in the windy mountain regions. And to be honest, you know, in the beginning, uh, Everything sounds exciting and a good idea. You know, we have alternatives, our methods to generate energy because we need more and more energy. Of course, there's, there's no doubt on that. And it sounds good, you know, do building up wine, wine turbines and bringing the landscape where it's windy on the mountains or like Simon said, offshore, where it's also very windy. It sounds good. It sounds clean, green. By the end, it's absolutely not. But I can say from my perspective, I have a lot of friends who are very resistant in, in, uh, against it, uh, who are, are professors from different universities, and it says, no, not at all. It's destroying the environment totally, and it's changing the climate. It's changing um, the weather systems. It, it's changing the bio biology, the, the fauna, and everything around it. I give an example. For example, when you, when you build, when you see wine turbines uh, on land, like in mountains, in, in, maybe it's in, in, it's not close to cities, so it's in nature. A lot of nature is going to be destroyed. But first of all, this huge, huge, huge turbines. When you stand in front of it, you, you have an, an idea how huge it is. Most of them, people see them miles away. But when you stand in front of it, uh, you stand like this. It's it's huge. So to bring all the stuff there in nature, you destroy a lot of land because you have to imagine you don't carry them on donkeys or on horses you know you have huge trucks you you need really really strong broad roads to bring this the materials uh into this area so you, you destroy a lot of nature forest whatever's done just to build the roads then you bring a tons and tons and tons thousands and thousands of trucks moving in and out every day Every day, and they're not, and they're driving on gas, on gasoline, and not on electricity, bringing tons and tons on concrete in to build this huge, huge fundament because otherwise it 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 it's it's not working. So tons and tons on concrete in nature, this is not good. And then you build up this huge turbines. Um, as as Simon said, it's changing everything. We I I, I met uh, friends in 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 Spain and Dr. Checking, you know them, uh, Maria and, and Lucio, friends of mine. We had them on the show, uh, who were very resistant. I met friends in in North Germany, where very a lot of uh, wine turbines are there, and they tell me that the soil is totally dried out because not because of the climate change, because of the wind, because wind 
I actually, I was washing my clothes today and it was a windy day and it dried in an hour because of the wind, not of the, of, of the heat, because of the wind. So the wind that is produced by the turbines is drying out the soil and destroying the soil totally. It's destroying the whole nature. As Simon said, birds who are on the route from north to south, they're not changing their route. They follow the route since, I don't know, hundred years or thousands of years. They get in the environment. You can see thousands and thousands of shredded birds on the ground. So there's a lot of change going on in there. And the other thing is, uh, a friend of mine sent me pictures. You cannot recycle uh uh, how to say it, the, the rotator blades. You cannot re recycle them. It's really toxic material. So what they do it is a huge, huge uh, wind, wind turbines rotators. They just dig it in the ground. They make huge graves, put it in, cover it with, with soil, and that's all. And it's it's a toxic bomb for future generation. That's my stuff. I, and I'm very looking I'm very looking forward to hear something about from Simon's perspective on, 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 the, on, on the offshore. But land in... It sounds good for people who are not educated. It sounds good, alternatives, but it's really, it's a nightmare for nature. Yeah, totally agree. And, uh, and the other thing is, of course, the wind doesn't blow all the time. Uh, it's not a constant. Uh, so, you know, you get a lot of calm days, in particular in the summer months as well. And even those beautiful, crisp winter mornings and winter days when you know, it, it, it looks absolutely beautiful outside, but there's no wind, not a breath of it, uh, February in particular. And at that time, demand for electricity is high. So, uh, you know, there, there, there's a, a loss of purpose there as well. And you're absolutely right about the toxicity of the, uh, of, of the turbine blades as well. Um, you know, they are non-recyclable. So this is a big problem. But at, at sea, I mean, let's look at the, the seabed. Uh, the, these turbines, they're, they're, they're about 100, 100 yards or 100 meters plus, some of them up to 300 meters in length. So they are huge, huge, big installations. So they have to be anchored into the seabed one way or another. Now, they have two different types. One is the fixed one where it's like a long pole and it goes rammed into the seabed itself as a static fixture. But then there are floating turbines as well, which have got enormous moorings and a lot of big, big, heavy chain uh, and, and anchors which will weigh 20 or 30 tons just to hold this thing in place to stop it from getting washed away. Now, the, the effect that that makes on the seabed uh, does affect the habitat, obviously, of, uh, of, of fish and shellfish and uh, all marine life, in particular when the, these things are being installed. And it takes years for the seabed to get back, uh, you know, regenerate where it can support, uh, you know, fish and, and, and marine life. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, the other issue, which is, a, is, is quite a serious one, which hadn't been worked out again beforehand now, and that is that with these big wind farms as they call them and it's vast vast areas we've got a new one about to be opened off the west coast of scotland which is one of the smaller ones at 784 square miles I and mean, it's a uh, it's huge uh, by any man's standards but it's not one of the bigger ones we've got in the uk off the east coast yeah that's where the big boys are now the seabed alters because you've got the current flowing, in particular in the North Sea, it's a very strong current of tide going uh, going in and out, and that moves in a north to south direction. So this build, builds up behind these the, the, these wind turbines. Uh, the sand gets shifted and forms sandbanks uh, and reefs uh, quite a distance away from the from the wind farms, starting from the wind farms and moving quite a quite a distance away. So it's altering the uh, the, the whole shape and layout of the seabed which in itself is again altering the current speeding up the current flows and eddies and so on that go around it so the massive differences there uh, one of the uh, wind farms have got or it's one of the companies should i say that's uh, got installations have got 18 applications in for uh, for sites for these wind farms and out of the 18 of these sites 16 of them are on prime haddock spawning grounds and juvenile fish uh, uh, you know, nursery areas. So if they go, 
then uh, the uh, you know because of the installation, then they'll never come back. They might move further north as the sea temperatures rise, as cod and mackerel and so on have have all started to move a bit further north, and we're getting warmer water fish coming into our waters now. So um, if these fish go, then as I say we never get them back, and there goes the fishing industry, which is supporting tens of thousands of jobs. So it's a uh, you know a big false economy. But there are alternatives. And uh, you know, a big issue with the windmills as well is they don't look particularly attractive. But if they were to look at other technologies and really put the money where the mouth is there and go in for it, likes of, of uh, wave power, well, not so much the wave power, but uh, tidal energy, because the tide comes in and out twice every day. It's a constant. It will always come in. It will always go out again. So there are lots of areas around every coast where you've got a good strong current and you have you know, a big turbine put down on the seabed and let it go there have been experiments and trials with them and they've actually all been very successful uh, they've overcome issues of uh, the, the fish being sucked into these uh, the, these turbines they've got deflectors and so on where uh, you know it, the, the fish will go around them rather than through them likewise with seals and, and whales and so on so uh, that is a is a good alternative, I and mean, it's the same as well with the solar panels. I mean, they've got uh, you know you go go to warmer warmer countries, and they've got great big acreages of uh, of solar panels and solar farms. Well, we're there. The sun doesn't always shine. I know technology has moved on, and they got the, uh, the voltaic uh, cells now where they work off daylight. Uh, not just sunlight, but they're quite happy with daylight as well to generate the uh, generate the power. So there are a lot of alternatives, and I think the you know it's very sad to see that governments have all you know sort of like lemmings jumping off a cliff. One follows the other. Each government is following the other now with having wind technology. It's the trendy thing, but they'll wake up to this one day soon and realise there is a problem there, big problem. Absolutely. Simon, I have a question. You mentioned tide, tide uh, alternatives. I have a question. Tides related to the wind turbines offshore. Are there data available that there's thousands and thousands of offshore wind turbines? Do they have an impact on the tides, on the height of the waves, on the tides itself? Do you think there's a long term, a long term impact that it's changing? Um. They won't affect the tide uh, because the, the tide, uh, that, that's you know, governed by the the lunar pull, the, the gravity from you know the pull, the gravitational pull with the moon. So when the moon is at its closest, your tide's high. It goes away and it's it's lower. So uh, that the tide will always ebb and flow, but uh, the the current itself, the way the, the it eddies round, though you'll get changes there, and that's what's kicking up the sediment from the seabed. And creating these big sandbars and, uh, and and reefs elsewhere, which weren't there before. All the all the charts are all admiralty charts are all having to be re redrawn now because they suddenly realised a place which was twenty fathoms deep uh, is now maybe only ten fathoms deep. So restricting to various different types of shipping, and this the, the, this change in depth could be 20 or 30 miles away from, from the wind farm. It doesn't mm -hmm. just center around the wind farm itself. It's the distance away. So, you know, if you imagine if you've got a, you know, a bowl of water and you put sand in it, and then with a straw, blow through the straw at the sand, and it'll the sand will shift through the water and it will deposit itself further off. Well, that's what's happening on the seabed just now mm -hmm. with these wind installations. That was a great analogy. Thank you, Simon. I'm really learning a lot from the two of you. A uh, question that I have is, do we know where the first wind farm installation was? And has there been any research that is that people can evaluate and say, okay, this wind farm was put in on this date as a result, this, this, and this is happening? Because, you know, there are people who don't believe it, right? They don't believe that it's causing any damage. <laughs> yeah. I think that I mean the wind, the, the, well, the wind farms have, uh, and the windmills have, have um, you know evolved from the old uh, windmill which would drive um, grindstones for for making flour, 
uh, you know, somebody sort of thought, oh yeah, okay, it turns out we'll down. So, you know, an electric generator at the bottom of that will uh, create, uh, you know, create electricity. And so there's the birth of your uh, modern windmills. Bring back Don Quixote. <laughs> he was a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have I had uh, for your question. I had a neighbor when I've been living in Mallorca, and he became a billionaire by actually twenty years already. He started uh, building huge wind parks for the, for example in South America in the Atacama Desert, and he made a lot of money. It, it's an investment in the beginning, but he made a lot of money because he had long term contracts with the government, so they take all the electricity, and he told me it's. It's an incredible business and there's a huge lobby, but they know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what the impact is and they pay a hell on lobbying. They pay a hell on money on journalists not to write about the, the, the truth. Yes, yeah. There's, I mean, the, the, the installations themselves are not the only problem uh, at sea because uh, all that power being generated there has got to come ashore to go feed into the grid. Uh, whether the grid works or not, a different matter. But you've got the cables coming from these uh, offshore installations coming ashore. Now, they uh, they tried to hush it up, but it came came out uh, with some conscientious scientists who'd worked out that uh, this was actually having a very detrimental effect on migratory pa passage of, of uh, the brown crab, which is a big fishery in the UK. And the crabs... They, they, they migrate in an anti-clockwise direction around the uh, shores of the UK. But they've come to these, the, the, these um, electric cables, and which are massive, great big hefty cables going from the wind farms coming ashore. And the electromagnetic field that's been uh, the, you know, evolved around the cables uh, mesmerizes them and they sort of seem to get high on it and they stop and they don't move on from there. So, uh, you know, you've got a big congregation of, of crabs in an area where you're not actually allowed to fish anyway. Uh, and they're just, uh, you know, totally hooked on this uh, electromagnetic uh, field that's around it. But the other thing which is causing uh, big, big concern, even more so, is the animalities in, uh, in lobster and crab and even in, uh, in fish as well. Um, you know, there's deformities appearing in lobster and crab, and it's been associated particularly for the areas around where the cables are. So uh, it, this is another another thing where science hasn't caught up with the uh, the speed of the generation of these uh, these windmills. It's, it, it, it's a lot of government money being thrown at it. A lot of people are making a huge amount of money out of it, and uh, and that's it. And it's just saying. To hang with everything else, you know, we've got this great idea. You know, throw money at us. We'll put them up there. We'll pump the power ashore, and uh, you know, what happens to the ecology of it? Yeah, it doesn't really matter. We don't see it. It's out of sight. It's out of mind. Yeah. Uh, Simon, that's one interesting point you may, you mentioned the, the electromagnetic field around the cables. Because what most people don't know is that the energy that is harvested offshore is not arriving on the land because you through the length of the cable you lose a lot of energy so what you mm -hmm. harvest you don't get on land you're losing a lot of energy because i have solar panels on my motorhome and then they told me the longer the cable the more we lose so the shorter the distance the better so with the longer the cable from offshore to inland the more electricity lose it's not not everything is is really is can really be used that it's been harvested in the beginning Absolutely right. And you can't sort of boost it halfway along to speed up the flow. That doesn't work. So that, uh, yes, you are. You're absolutely right. It does go, does go down. And it's also, you know, what do they do when these things have reached the end of their shelf life? Uh, what do they do with them? I mean, they're huge. And the cost of putting them up is colossal, but the cost of taking them down is equally colossal. And uh, as we discussed earlier with the turbine blades, what do you do with them? They're non-recyclable and also create toxicity in the ground. Um, again, an area, you know, they say, yeah, to heck with science, it doesn't matter. You know, we're making money out of this. I remember I was at a, 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 a conference once or a discussion seminar which was being delivered by the managing director of one of the companies that makes these turbines. And 
he uh, openly said at the at the meetings as well the uh, these things have a 15 year shelf life if you like and they you know after that then they need to be replaced for the the actual motor part of it itself he said but to build one of these motors takes a, takes about three or four times the amount of energy that it will ever produce in its lifetime. So again, I thought, and this was years ago, and I thought, well, what a waste of time all this is, really. Absolutely. And as you said, you know, with the cables, that most of the cables are made of copper. And we all know that mining copper is not a very environmental friendly process, too. So we are we are really wasting a lot of energy and resources to produce to produce this whatever we want to call it for a quite a short term of of of, of lifetime. Yeah, <laughs> it was actually a slight change of subject, but it's on a similar vein. Uh, I was reading an article. Uh, it was only yesterday, I think it was, that uh, the, uh, the lithium. You know. The, looking at electric cars the lithium for the batteries is mined in america it's shipped to norway where it's made into the lithium batteries which are then shipped out to japan to make the cars which are then shipped back out to america uh, <laughs> there's an awful lot of shipping going on which is all using uh, a considerable amount of diesel oil and, uh, and, and heavy fuel oil to, uh, to to do the transportation so I don't think they're quite as environmentally friendly as they uh, like to make out they are not at all not at all Simon you're absolutely correct I, I know there was a, a study coming out in Bavaria you know the, the motor industry of the BMW the Mercedes and the English the Audi and they brought out the new Audi and they said uh, to produce this just this one vehicle with all this battery lithium all the shipping around the globe uh, for assembling it you can run a normal car 250,000 miles on gasoline before you before you have a benefit out from electricity, to, yeah. but who the sorry who the hell is driving a car two hundred fifty thousand miles? First, first thing. Secondly, is uh, I, I'm here in a very um, rural countryside, and more and more people are buying electricity car. Well, I, I don't like them at all. I said I, I drove I drove them when I was a kid, but anyway, on on the circus. But most of the station where you can charge your car. Is run by these to generate a list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I mean, I, 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 I'm not. I'm not sold on the idea of an electric car at all. Uh, in the UK, I mean, it's, uh, there's a big push on just now to uh, sell electric cars, and apparently, the figures last year um, reckon that there were 30 percent more electric cars sold last year in the UK than diesel cars. So. Uh, I sort of thought, you know, with horror at this time of year, we've got, uh, you know, peak holiday traffic time as well. And not so much in Scotland, but particularly uh, down towards Cornwall, the southwest of England there, you get queues and queues of cars and traffic jams on them. The, the, the freeways or motorways or whatever, getting, getting to Cornwall. Now, these electric cars, they're going along there. And they get stuck in this traffic jam there, and of course, you know, they've got the radio on the, because it's hot. They've got the the, the you know the, the cold air blowers on, the aircon on, which is all burning up their battery power. And if one breaks down, the others can't get round the side of it, so the, they'll all finish up out of charge. I mean, you know, you can't just sort of nip down to your local uh, gas station or petrol station with a with a can and top up another charge of fuel that doesn't work you've actually got to take the car there to uh, to have it charged uh, i mean I, I drive about the country extensively in my work as well and there's for the number of electric cars in the road surprisingly few uh charging stations and areas where they they can get a proper charge uh, you charge them at home overnight. Well, our electricity bills here have just gone through the roof with the uh, you know, government took off the capping uh, of electricity prices. So it's actually the electric cars are now just about as expensive to run as, uh, you know, as petrol or diesel. Uh, but the, the big risk is, you know, they go along and they suddenly run out of charge. Apparently, the, the new thing now as well, instead of road rage, is battery rage with people yeah just absolutely freaking out. Are we going to have enough power to get to where we want to? I mean, I could get into my car and I could drive down to London, which is, uh, you know, about uh, 
12, 14, maybe 15 hours away. And uh, I would make one, possibly two stops to, to fill up with diesel. And uh, <laughs> if I had an electric car, I would have to stop, I don't know, five, six times. And the length of time to charge a car, you need to stop at least half an hour, if not more. So the journey time is considerably increased. So the whole world will have to slow down. Uh, and we, we all know the pace of life for everybody is speeding up. But with the electric cars, it's going to slow it all down. So there's going to be a lot of frustration going on there. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's not only charging half an hour. You have to be lucky that there's no queue for charging. Right. Because exactly. here in Germany, yes. there's a lot of queues. And it's it's interesting when 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 I hear politicians say uh, in Germany, uh, you know, the motor car company, uh, by 2030, they want 80 percentage on electric car. My question is, how can you imagine everyone is coming home from the office? 5 p.m., 6 p.m., charging the car. How does it work? Because we have we have already an energy challenge uh, crisis. We don't have elect electricity. Everyone plugging in the electric car. How, how should this work? <laughs> Quite. And the reckon as well, these charging stations, 10% of them don't work. Exactly. Sorry, I have a question for you. I know you're a yachtsman and a, a sailor. I'm wondering... I, I went for a walk yesterday and I saw over the bridge there were so many boats. I couldn't believe it. And I, how will these wind turbines affect boaters? Um, it won't make a lot of difference, except for there's areas where you just won't be able to sail. Um, that's it. It's uh, But with leisure craft, the, the wind, wind farms tend to be a little for, bit further offshore than, than yachtsmen would normally go. Uh, you know, people are you know up here just now in the west of Scotland. I mean, we're in, in full summer mode at the moment. It's uh, it's a bit dull out there just now, but and it's been colder today. But we've actually had a glorious spell of weather where it's not been too hot, but the sun has been there, and it's been fantastic sailing weather for uh, you know for those in the boating world. But the, I mean, yachtsmen tend not to go any more than maybe five or six miles offshore. But to get to the wind farms, you're really about 12 miles offshore. So unless you're making a passage, uh, again, particularly in the North Sea, if you're uh, you know, sailing from, uh, say, Edinburgh and going to, uh, to, to the Copenhagen or somewhere like that, or you know, up to Norway, then uh, you're going to have to you know, negotiate your way around wind farms. Uh, so... Yeah, you know, and that obviously that kind of distance involves night passages as well. So you've just got to be, uh, you know, have your wits about you and be careful where you go. But it doesn't affect the uh, the, the sailors so much closer to shore. Thank goodness, not yet anyway. <laughs> Thanks for that answer. I I didn't know if the actual moving of the wind would actually pull the sailboat closer to it, but I I don't know anything about boating, so. <laughs> It would certainly uh, have uh, an interesting effect with creating, uh, you know, eddies around it. And if you sail towards one of these things, there's, you know, probably strong risk of a catabatic wind, which is a, you know, a wind usually goes along like that. But a catabatic wind comes straight down. Uh, we get that in a lot of the uh, the sea locks here as well, and uh, the fjords of, of Norway. You can be sailing along, and you've got a good wind, sort of coming on the quarter of the next minute. Whack! One's coming down, and it flat, flattens you out. Uh, it's happened to me a few times in in, in my yacht racing career. It's been uh, quite exciting, shall we say? And it gets very wet and very cross. But if you know how where to expect these catabatic winds, you can use them to you know to a good effect and. Uh, they are tactically as well, but that's a different story when it comes to your race. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Roland, last question for Simon, over to you. So Simon, what are you recommending to our audience? I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm very, I'm very straight and I said, okay, sign up every petition and say no to the government. No, because the side effects are more, much worse then 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 we gain from from wind turbines what, what is your recommendation 
Yeah, I mean, there's any amount of, tur of um, turbines going about, any any amount of petitions going about as well, uh, you know, for you know not wanting these things. Uh, we've had this problem, in particular with the land-based ones, again because nobody wants those, in, you know, outside their house or you know, a, a beautiful view looking across a, a, a valley or a glen. And they don't want to see these things there. It takes the beauty away from it. So there's always strong opposition to that. So the government decided, oh, well, you know, we won't build any more wind turbines onshore now. But we'll put them all offshore. That doesn't matter. You, know, we, we do, we, you don't see them out there. It doesn't really matter. Well, it does. Uh, and I think there's more of an ecological issue created offshore now than, uh, than people have actually realised. And I think there's still a lot more to come out of that, too. So, you know, what you said earlier, Roland, was absolutely right there with the uh, the infrastructure to uh, build the roads to, to ship these things up. And they, they are enormous. And uh, so it needs a very sturdy road to, uh, to you know, to build, to take the, the lorries to, to, to deliver these things to their sites. And um, the concrete basis to, to hold them in position as well. So you know all that is uh, is has has a significant effect on the uh, you know on on the landscape and the drying of the soil and the shredding and the pheasants and so on, but offshore equally we've got this problem with it changing the shape of the seabed uh, and creating these sandbars and reefs and so on uh, you know long way from from where the the installations actually are just by the scouring effect created by the currents of the of, of the water going around them uh, and the uh, you know the issues to the the, the spawning stocks and the, uh, the 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 juvenile nursery areas for our fish as well and then you've got the cables with the soporific effect they're having on the crab and also the deformities it's creating in it so i mean there's just a, you know there's a plethora of problems uh, arising both on land and on sea as well but uh, as I say, sadly, it's just this attitude of out of sight, out of mind. Absolutely. And, and that's so important that people are aware of what's going on, what they don't see offshore. And, and as you said, it's the same like on land. You have to transport it. And even on the sea, they're not using rowing boats to bring the material there. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very sizable uh, you know, shipping that's used for those. And, uh, and then they've got to be serviced as well. Yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, they've got, you know, many days they can't get near, particularly the North Sea is a wicked bit of water because the North Sea is relatively shallow and you've got a huge volume of water trying to push its way through. So you get very, very big seas, and, you know, really nasty, sort of short, sharp ones as well, which, uh, you know, it doesn't make life easy. So if you're trying to negotiate a, you know, a, a service vessel uh, that's maybe taking a new blade out to one of the blades is broken or buckled or whatever, then, uh, you know, it's got to go out. So you've got a big ship going out there and then a, a platform with its cranes and hoists to lift this thing up. You need pretty calm weather to to do that job because it's a, it's a precision job. And, uh, you know, if the, if the boat's rocking about all over the place, then you can't do it. So, uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of, uh, you know, major, major issues that, uh, you know, arise around that. On land, fine, the road's solid. You drive up to it, you get your big crane, whoop, old one off, new one on. At sea, you could be sitting around there for two, three days or more uh, in, in bad weather, waiting for that little window in the weather where it's calm enough to be able to go in and actually do the job. Thank Simon, Simon, thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. So much great information that you shared. And before we go, I do want to bring up your website so that people can celebrate the fact that you've launched this and they can learn more about you. So let's take a look. All right, here we go. So we're launching soon. 18 days, 5 hours, 13 minutes and 10 seconds. Yes, oh my god, don't forget the 10 seconds. Oh, <laughs> there's that. I know, have a good laugh. <laughs> no, it's great. I'm glad you have your website, yeah. and so people can learn more about you here, author yes. and television presenter. Oh, I recognize that logo from somewhere. Ooh, I love that logo, <laughs> absolutely fantastic, fantastic. And, and Simon, people one, can one oh, of my ahead. quotations. 
Yes, you're, the you're famous for your quotes. And their footprints on the moon. It's so true. I love that one. And then there's the contact section there. Cool. All right, people can get in touch with you there. Anything else sure. you want people to know about you, Simon, before we leave today? Uh, yes, you can watch me on, uh, on on USA Global TV every Wednesday afternoon at, uh, well, four o'clock UK time uh, or whatever time that equates to wherever in the world you happen to be. And that's on the uh, you know, on the UK show. It's, it's a fantastic show. It's really great fun. There's a uh, you know, crowd of us there. Um, Dr. Jacqueline, of course, and, and Diane Floyd, Floyd Bem, uh, Ian Pelham Turner and, and Helen Achard, who are Royal Correspondents correspondents and photographers uh, over here so great show join us every wednesday Have thank some you fun. so much <laughs> thank you simon thank you for your time and for all of the education and awareness that you brought today on our launching episode our pilot our first show we're really honored to have you thank you simon it was an honor and pleasure thank you so much uh, it's an honor to be here as well, particularly with it being the, being the inaugural one, the first one. I hope I haven't spoiled <laughs> it for everybody else. <laughs> no, I have many more questions, so we'd love to have you back. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always here and very, very keen to, to, to help out in any way I can. But uh, yes, I wish this show all the very best of luck. And uh, you know, I'm sure it will do extremely well because it's a very topical issue now. And uh, you know, we need to create the awareness of it. And OK, today we've really gone into the downside and we've absolutely trashed all the windmills and so on and renewable energy and, and electric cars and so on. But there's a lot of good things to come as well. So, uh, you know, watch the show as well. I think you'll, you can learn a lot. Thank you, Simon. That's a really good point that we are going to have various perspectives about different topics and they'll be uplifting as well. So thank you for that. Roland, we have your website also that I just want to, I know you have a zillion websites, but let's just share your website if people want to reach out to you. There it is. Where should I go yeah. in here? Yes, you can just scroll down. It's a scrolling website. It's my overview website, and from there you can link to my business website uh, and also to my coaching website on Wireless Life Rocks, but also to my men's group, yes. Okay, and it's in German for people who are wondering what language it is, right? Well, you're in the German one, but it's also available in English for sure. When you press on the, on the American flag, it's also available in English. Smart, I love that. All right, thank you both Lovely. for being here. And we are going to sign off. Roland, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? And what's coming up right after this show? Yeah, the best way to get in touch with you is, is contact me on, on the website, rolandfriedel.com. You will have a contact form or you email my email me directly. It's office at rolandfriedel.com, R-O-L-A-N-D-F-R-I-E-D-L, rolandfriedel.com. That's the option. Yeah, and 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 stay and stay tuned for the next show. It's the Mallorca Connection. I'm very looking forward to that. And I will I'll talk about business ideas. It's, so it's for people who want to start a business, but they don't have an idea what kind of business it fits to them, what fits to their budget, what fits to their skills, or what fits to their dreams and goals. So we talk about this. All right. Thank you very much. And for those of you out there, do you have what it takes to be a TV presenter on USA Global TV and radio? Reach out to me if you are interested in finding out what it takes to be a Roland Friedel or a Simon McDonald. It's, it's a special gift and talent that certain people have, and we're looking to expand and grow. So if you want to join our team, please do reach out. You can contact me by going to usaglobaltv.com where there's a contact form. All right. That's all we have for right now. As we close out our show, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, the British School of Excellence. And then we'll be right back with our next show, The Mallorca Connection. Bye for now. Bye. This Bye. program is brought to you in part by the British School of Excellence and founder, Mr. Philip Sykes, building confidence, changing lives. Do you share our view that etiquette is a set of modern life skills that are essential for personal and professional success? Join us as an etiquette coach and change people's lives through the power of etiquette and manners. The last few days have been really amazing. I uh, had the trainer trainer course from uh, the British School of Etiquette. 
and I must say it's been one of the best decisions I've ever made and one of the best investments I've made in, in my own training and development. Now, words alone will not describe the transformation and the positive path that I have traveled with the British School of Etiquette. I find really, I, I learned a lot from the lessons this time I came. The last few days with the British School of Etiquette have been fantastic. And what I've learned now is really beyond my expectations. This is the most rewarding experience and the best investment I have made this year. It was just great, I learned so much and when I go back to Belgium I will incorporate a lot of it uh, into um, my day-to-day -day life and business. It's been absolutely wonderful for the whole week that we were here. I feel transformed and I feel like blowing a trumpet and tell people come and do this school, this class is the best, this is the best school ever. Uh, you should take it, it's just, it will change your life immediately. I am now able to teach other people how to bring the best of them. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to our clients for their testimonials on the Train the Trainer program. Our exponential and global growth is so significant that we've evolved from the British School of Etiquette to the British School of Excellence, where we're investors in people. Let us invest in you and your career. Contact us to become an etiquette coach. Go to thebritishschoolofexcellence.com. Start your career and elevate your success today.